So let us press forward this morning, beloved, as we once again look from Romans 14 and 15 from God's word for counsel that will recalibrate our focus toward eternal principles. Last week, we concluded with a fifth uh, calibration as we looked at this text of Scripture that we ought to live with sensitivity and confidence. Uh, live with sensitivity and confidence. And then number six, also last week, is to live to emulate Christ. Live to emulate Christ. The first four prior to that were to live as a peacemaker and an encourager. And that is in chapter 14, verse 18 and 19. And then live for the kingdom, live for kingdom goals in verses 16 and 17 of chapter 14. Also live considering eternity. Make sure that the way that you're living today is focused on eternity and not the temporal. But then in verses 1 through 9 of Romans 14, live expressly for the Lord Jesus Christ. Live expressly for the Lord Jesus Christ. I do want us to really think about the transition in the 15th chapter of Romans. And when you say that we, are, we who are strong in verse 1 of Romans 15 have an obligation to bear with the failings of the weak and not to please ourselves. Let each of us please his neighbor for his good. And what is the good to build him up? But now look at this text, beloved, for Christ. That's the example here. Because Christ is the example. Christ is the motive. And, and then he is the one who did not please himself. But he suffered the reproaches, the criticism, the ridicule, the, the insults that, that were aimed for the Father. Christ took them upon himself in order that he may glorify the Father. And so as we look at Christ as the example, we move forward into number seven. Recalibration number seven, it is verses five through six of Romans 15. Live for the glory of God. Live for the glory of God. This, of course, verses 5 and 6, is, is actually a prayer petition that this will come into fruition in the lives of God's people, the believers in Rome and of, all, of God's people throughout the ages. It says, may the God of endurance and encouragement grant you to live in such harmony with one another, in accord with Christ Jesus, that together, notice that, beloved, together you may with one voice glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Of course, it is a twofold purpose that you find here in verses 5 and 6 of Romans 15. First, it is a prayer that is according to the will of God. It is in harmony with God's will. But secondly, it serves as an exhortation. Now, this prayer is a prayer that you will fulfill this in your life. And so in this text here, beloved, you find that as the prayers to God, you find that God is also the source he is the source. And so he's the source of endurance, endur endurance and encouragement. And because he's the source of endurance and encouragement, he's also the supply for the saints and their endurance and their encouragement. And so because he's the, the, the supply, he enables us. He enables us to endure. He enables us to encourage each other as he builds endurance in us and encourages us. Now, think about that truth in your life. God lovingly bears up with you in your sin. Your sins provoked him before salvation. He hated your sin before he saved you. He still hates your sin. But he still graciously bears up with you, graciously pursues you by his spirit. He's brought you into a loving fellowship with him through the Lord Jesus Christ. He forgives the sins as you confess them. He restores the fellowship with you. He never abandons uh, the union with Christ. He continues to uphold you in Christ. He pursues you when you sin. He seeks after you so that you may be more like Christ. That's your God. And so after you grasp the patience of your God in your own life, you can love and receive each other. Think about that. The degree or the extent that you see the patience that God has with you is the extent that you will have the patience toward others. When you understand the theology of God's endurance and God's long-suffering towards you in Christ, it is much easier for you to bear up with others in an extensive manner because you know that God has done the very same thing with you and continues to do that with you. Do you want to know who you're bearing up with? I mean, people who are bearable make you smile. Someone, you hear their name and you beam when their name's called. You just light up. 
But no, it's not the people who light up your life. It's those who may be unbearable, difficult to bear up with. In fact, the close relative to this word here is the word provoking. Because the prayer is that you learn the patience of God, the endurance of God, when you provoke him with your willful sin, even though you're saved and you know better. He's long-suffering toward us. It's a great mercy, dear saints. We never want to take sin lightly. Please, let's not do that. But you know you sin. You know you have. You know you sin. You know you will. That's the tragedy. Until Christ gives you a glorified body, all three apply to you have, you, you are, and you will. What great mercy shows to us this God who, who cannot tolerate sin. Sin cannot dwell with him. Yet he's patient and enduring with you, long-suffering with you. The degree that you grasp this is the extent that you're able to bear up with others. And that's why this prayer is there. May this God of endurance and encouragement grant you as a gift, his gift, who himself is a God of patience and encouragement. May he gift this to you in verse 5 as this gift to you from God, grant you to live in such harmony with one another. The sense here is to have the same mind or think the same way or have the same mind of Christ. The prayers that you and I would live as Christ lived. To always focus on what matters the most. That through genuine love, sincere Christian love and care for each other, that we would all together pursue God's glory in all that we do. And of course, in verse 5, it says, in accord with Christ Jesus, or according to Christ Jesus, sometimes that idea of according to means the standard of a thing, the standard being Christ, or according to the standard that represents Christ, according to the standard that Christ embodies, we ought to do the same thing. His will was to do the Father's will. His example was of, of holiness and obedience to the Father, His instruction to follow Him and to love each other. So when believers grow, we will glorify God together according to the standard that Christ has established for us. It is not a lower standard. We must remember that God's standard is absolute perfection. We're all called to pursue it, albeit we will not attain to it. But the standard should always be the Lord Jesus Christ. Listen, saints, the standard is not your neighbor. The standard is not how willing or unwilling they may be. The standard is the Lord Jesus Christ. The ultimate standard, the barometer, is the Lord Jesus Christ. It is not according to us. What is the goal in verse 6? The goal is the glory of God that together, that as we are intent on one purpose, we engaged in this together. When we care for one another, we're engaged together. When we genuinely love one another, we're doing this together. And the results are united thoughts about God's glory, united voice for God's glory, and then a church that is united in Christ for the glory of the living God. Well, let us answer this question. What is one evidence of this united effort? Well, one evidence is that you will spend your energy encouraging a struggling believer. You will, you will expend your energy encouraging another patiently, as God does the same with you when you are discouraged. But, beloved, the goal for doing this is, is not to elicit or receive a response from them that is favorable because you may not. The goal must always, must always be centered that God may be praised, that he may be magnified, that this, this attribute of God, a God of endurance and encouragement, that, that those attributes will be displayed in your life consistently in your life as you live for the glory of God. That when they see your good works, that they will glorify the Father who is in heaven. They will know that God is with you because of your ability to bear up lovingly, graciously, persistently, consistently. Consistently. 
They will give God the glory and the praise because they know that is from Him. It is not normal. It is not human. It is just not of us. It must be outside of us. It must be above us. And it is. It is God with us. The United Church for the Glory of God has an effect on not only individual Christians, the community, but also the world around us. The highest goal, my dear saints, is the glory of God. That's the chief aim that puts everything else that we do in proper perspective. If you start with God's glory and work your way down, that is the perspective to have. If you start with people and work your way up, it's an impasse, an impossibility. It's a hardship, a difficulty. But when you start with the glory, how can I best bring praise and honor to God from my lips and the lips of others? Through this action, this decision, this choice, this relationship, this interaction, this struggle, this challenge, this trial, whatever it may be, how may I best make sure that first of all, that whenever someone responds to my deeds, that they will say, I glorify God for what he's doing in your life. That is a life that is lived for the glory of God. But number eight. Our final counsel for recalibration is this in verse 7. Live knowing that Christ welcomed you. Live knowing that Christ welcomed you. Did he not? It says in verse 7, therefore, which is a grand summary of all that was said leading up to this, beginning with verse 1 of, of Romans 14, therefore, Welcome one another as Christ has welcomed you for the glory of God. And so when you and I receive each other with mutual acceptance, with love and with care, when our love continues to remain unimpeded by circumstances, that you're doing the welcoming and the loving just as Christ has done for you. This sense of just as or even as mean, do it in the same way. Let this mind, this welcoming mind, be in you that was also in Christ Jesus. Let this warm receptability, this loving receptability be in you. Because that is the attitude that Christ had toward you. How did Christ welcome you? Well, with great mercy with pity, sorrow over your weak and wandering soul in sin and death, friendship, Christ befriends enemies, and by the power of the Spirit of God, he makes them friends. You know, the scripture says that even though we were enemies in our mind, hostile in our mind, he, he calls enemies he doesn't call friends. He calls enemies friends, and he equips them to be loyal friends. But how often have we been disloyal? Unfaithful. Unfriendly. Unloving. Uncaring. And yet Christ continues to care, to love, to show mercy, grace, Affection, patience. That's how he welcomes. He welcomes in faithfulness. But once again, the chief motivating factor, the motivating factor for Christ's welcome is, is for the glory of God. It was for the Father's glory. That's what keeps us motivated. It's the glory of God. Because if you recall the big picture, and one of the themes in Romans, it contrasts the glory of God that you now pursue with the glory of God that you once refused. You refuse to glorify him. You refuse to honor him as God. 
<clears throat> and now as we conclude this section, you can pursue the glory of God that you once refused to do in your sin and rebellion. Before you heard the good news and before God revealed Christ through the good news, you refused, you and I refused to give God glory in our sin and rebellion. We absolutely would not because we could not. You could not see his creation for what it is and rejoice in his power because you were willing to suppress the truth to pursue your own unrighteousness. You did not honor him for who he is. You did not honor him for who he is as God. So instead of becoming wiser, and we see this in our world today, my dear saints, instead of becoming wiser, people are becoming more and more foolish. They're upping the ante on foolish living, foolish thinking. It is almost embarrassing to watch. But the same, you think about your past without Christ, you think about the shame in your sin, you're embarrassed to even talk about some of them. If you actually rejoice in your sin, let me reacquaint you with the Savior. You ought to be ashamed of your sins, saddened by your sins. Broken over your sins. They're absolutely embarrassing and shameful. But the world in its folly, they're advertising their sins. Because they believe that evil is good. They've exchanged life for death. They've changed, exchanged the true glory of God for created things. But you know what happened in your life as it does for those who turn from their sin? That changes when the law of God invades that life of deception, that life of hypocrisy, that life of lawlessness, that life of absolute sinfulness, that life of just utter depravity and helplessness. It is the law of God that invades that darkness. And so your truth that you thought was your truth is now exposed for the lie that it really is. What does God do with the law? He removes your, your horrific fig leaves that covers your sins. You're covering your sins with temporal things. They're fig leaves. It leaves you with only one solution. It is God's way, not the world's way to salvation. The law makes it very clear. That everyone may be taking the southbound highway to get to a northbound destination. But they're all going to hell in their deception. God shines his holy spotlight on our sin-stained lies. Our deception and our lawless amendment of his terms of what are right and what is wrong. God's truth, his law, bluntly and truthfully defines what true righteousness is. It demands that you and I give an account to its requirements. It declares his curse on your guilt. And then it empties you of all of your excuses because they are worthless excuses, just like your sins are. You're guilty and desperately need of help. And in comes the gospel at this point. How do you welcome each other as Christ has welcomed you? Because you know of your lawlessness without Christ. You know of your sinfulness. You know of your guilt. You know of your utter ruin without Christ. You know of your guilt. You know that you're wrong. You know that you're this foul sinner. You know that you've committed evil against the holy God. And you're before his eyes as someone who's wicked because of your sin. That's the law of God. It exposes that. But in comes the gospel. The gospel of God's compassion and love in Christ Jesus. God's compassion for the lawless, the wayward, the wicked, the ungodly, the unholy, the perishing, the damned. The gospel, the good news, declaring of the finished work of Jesus Christ. And when you hear the good news that Christ came to die for you, yes, this lawless one. You can be 5, you can be 10, you can be 15, you can be 20, 25, 30, you can be 50, you can be 80. You may be weak in body, but you're still wicked at heart. The gospel comes in and rescues you from perishing. And God says, behold, I've sent my son to turn you from darkness to light, from sin 
from sin to salvation, from death to life. This is my son. Listen to him. And the good news declares what Christ has done for you. When you hear this message of Christ's perfect life and sacrifice for your imperfection and your inadequacies and your utter bankruptcy and sin, it sounds like music to your ears. Oh, dear saints, you welcome one another because you've never heard such great music before. Melody from heaven, from God, to this wayward soul who's brought face to face with his or her sin, recognizing the utter bankruptcy in their soul, the utter emptiness that cannot be filled with social events, with parties, with anything that this world may provide. They have come to the end of themselves because God's law has brought them there. The gospel is the melody. It comes as the very grace that we need. Now you no longer run from the good news. Instead, you run from the law's righteous demands. And you run to the Savior who alone satisfied God's righteous requirement for you. You can welcome each other when the gospel rings as a melody in your wounded soul. And now, you trust only in Christ for salvation. You confess to God that Christ indeed is Lord. That he did die for your sins and now you believe that it is true. And with that new heart God gives to you, you turn from your sin and you believe that God, by the power of the Holy Spirit, raised Christ from the dead for your sin. So that he may declare you righteous. So now your faith is in Christ alone. And you can welcome others because your faith is in him alone. He has done great things for you. He's now your salvation, your righteousness, your sanctification. His life and death on the cross are the only means that secured your salvation. And so now, because of God's mercy in the Lord Jesus Christ, what happens now, saints? God gives you up to his instruction. And so now you can live as a living sacrifice and serve each other for the glory of God. You can care for each other with Christ-like affection for the glory of God. You no longer suppress the truth. You glory in the truth. You long for the truth. You embrace the truth. And that truth is your cure for this exhausting times, my dear saints. That you welcome one another for the glory of God because you were received in your sin and rebellion by a gracious God. The law exposing the deeds of your heart, but the gospel exposing the grace of God in Christ. What a great melody that is to the soul. And if you're here and you don't know the Lord Jesus Christ, I pray that you not only hear the melody of, of the gospel, but you also hear the necessity of your ruin and sin. That, you, that the law exposes your sinfulness, your death, and that God will graciously grant you the Spirit's life so that you too may be saved and enjoy the fellowship that you can have with Christ Jesus and the saints. But let me just say this, beloved, in the power of God, you and I uh, can love, care, pray for, pursue, comfort, and encourage each other by living expressly for Christ, living considering eternity, living for kingdom goals, living as a peacemaker and an encourager, living with sensitivity and confidence, living to emulate Christ, living for the glory of God, <clears throat> and living knowing Yes, saints, that Christ welcomed you. And as we meditate on that truth, <clears throat> I do want to do something else together, my dear saints. I want us to, to think about how God can recalibrate areas of struggle that you and I may have, or you may know someone who's struggling. They want to obey, they want to, but they're struggling. It's a battle for them. Well, this is what we give them. We don't give them our opinion. We don't give them our thoughts. We give them the word of God. I want to talk about three areas specifically as we, we reflect on this passage. How can I be welcoming to someone who may struggle with unforgiveness? Who may struggle with unforgiveness? And these are applicational thoughts for us to apply personally, but also to help others. <clears throat> well, God's cure for forgiveness, I want you to think about Proverbs 19.11. I'd mentioned that a few weeks ago, but I want to look at this a little bit more. The end of that, that verse in Proverbs 19, it says, it is... His glory, 
or our glory or our honor to overlook an offense, to overlook an offense. The word for glory is sometimes translated as, as beauty. Sometimes it, it means what you adorn, something that you wear according to Derek Kidner, an apparel that you wear. The honor here is a wisdom from God and the willingness to forgive. So if you're struggling and welcoming someone because there's unforgiveness, the text here says it's a glory to be able to forgive, to overlook not passively over approving of their sins, but to overlook that offense that would inhibit your progress in caring for one another and loving each other. Another sense to this glory or honor is, is that you refuse to take revenge or stir controversy by applying God's wisdom. It equips you those who are in Christ, who are beaten to the word of God, to diffuse the problem with their readiness to forgive. It was William McCain who adds, <clears throat> the virtue which is indicated here, this glory, is more than a forgiving temper. It includes also the ability to shrug off insults and the absence of a brooding or a persistent, unhealthy meditation on the problem or brooding hypersensitivity. It is the ability to deny to an adversary the pleasure of hearing a yelp or a shout of pain, even when his words have inflicted wounds of making large allowances for human frailties and keeping the lines of communication open. It contains elements of toughness and self-discipline. It is the capacity to stifle a hot emotional reply and to sleep on an insult. To rest even though the insult is there to absorb the heat and the passion from the voice of another and be ready to love, to care, and to forgive when God grants you the opportunity to do so. That is God's cure for forgiveness. It is like winning a peril or badge of honor to overlook an offense because you're willing to conquer your anger above winning the argument. When you look at this verse in Proverbs, it is so much like our Father in heaven and his Son, the Lord Jesus Christ and our Savior. Consider what it says in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 32. To verse 2 of Ephesians 5, it says, be kind to one another. Ephesians 4, verse 32. Tenderhearted, forgiving one another As God in Christ forgave you. Therefore, it says, be imitators of God in verse 1 of Ephesians 5. As beloved children and walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. In 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 8. In 1 Peter 3, verse 8, the Apostle Peter is summarizing the goal of the Christian in adversity and persecution in their relationship to the government, but also in relationship to their jobs, their work, or slaves to their masters, up into marriages. He says, yeah, you are living as aliens, but listen, he says, finally, all of you in verse 8, have unity of mind, sympathy, brotherly love, a tender heart. That idea is be a good model of compassion. It's actually a combination of two words. The Greek is the word well and the word compassionate. Be well compassionate. You ought to be seasoned in the idea in the sense of being compassionate. You ought to have some experience in being compassionate. And this only comes from God, my dear saints. You and I, we just don't have that. <clears throat> 
But in Christ, it is ours, freely, readily to be distributed in our hearts. God has given this to us. And so the cure for forgiveness is to remember that it is, it is an honor to overlook an offense. That you can go to bed at night and rest well. You need not launch if someone offends you or hurts you, but you can go to God in prayer and sleep well and be ready for the next day to extend arms of compassion and grace to them. That's God's cure. It's, it's not God asking how do you feel. It's do you trust that this is true? Do you believe that this is important to do? Have you failed to do this? Have you failed to, to display forgiveness, the honor of, of absorbing an offense? Acknowledge that to God. Let him know your weakness. It's there. And then by his strength, be determined, my dear saints, to forgive. There's five of these in, in the notes, but I'm only going to give you three. The second one is God's cure for bitterness. God's cure for bitterness. Let me just say that bitterness is hatred's twin brother. So wherever there is bitterness, there's also animosity. Where there's animosity, there's hatred. 1 John chapter 3, verse 15, 1 John 3, 15 says, Anyone or everyone who hates his brother is a murderer. And you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. Ephesians 4.31, Ephesians 4.31, let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put, be put away from you along with all malice. But here's something that we have to think about carefully because it is a, a good chance that we have gotten used to the herb called bitterness. You know, some herbs taste bitter, but after a while you get used to it. You're like, sure, that herb's pretty good. The herb of bitterness can be pretty good, too, to the sinful heart. It feels good. It's, it's a sedative. It's like fine wine and spirits. Too much of it, and the whole world is a better place. That's bitterness. It feels really good, but it's sinfully good. Because accompanying bitterness is sinful speech, your speech is sinful, but also you begin to develop a resentful attitude toward the other party. You loathe them. You resent them. That's hatred. Do you know what happens after that? You have no intention of reconciling with them after all of that. None. That's bitterness. That's not holiness. That's bitterness. The writer in Hebrews 12, 15 says, hey, make sure that no root of bitterness springs up and causes trouble, and by it many become defiled. Let me give you another one. God's cure for anxiety. God's cure for anxiety. Proverbs chapter 12, verse 25. Proverbs 12, 25. Anxiety in a man's heart weighs him down. But a good word makes him glad. Let me just ask you to look at what anxiety does in three phases, what it does to the heart in like three phases. Phase number one is this. It gets into the depths of your thoughts. And within that same phase, it, it begins to lead your emotional responses. So it goes in deep and affects your emotional responses. Phase number two Anxiety produces unstable behavior. It's, it's almost like you, not that you're irrational, you're thinking, but because your thoughts are not consistent with the character and the word of God, your behavior will not be, so your behavior will be unstable, it will be inconsistent of that of a Christian. Well, that's phase number three. The third phase or the final phase is that you will develop inconsistencies in your relationships. And your actions 
are not going to correspond to the Word of God. Because your reactions will pass through the filter of anxiety. This issue of anxiety begins in the heart. The mind factors in obviously your thoughts here, but that's, that's the battleground, it's the heart. And so only the Word of God can cure that. Time does not cure anxiety. Scripture does. The words of Christ. The end of COVID is not going to cure anxiety. Only God's word will cure anxiety. I just can't wait till this is over. Then I feel so much better. No, it's only going to mask a deeper problem. You know, these, these issues exposes where we really are. The reason why you get better at it is because we have a way of just covering our sin. But I pray that instead of you being offended by this truth perpetually, that if you're offended initially, which is necessary, that you will see that this offense needs to be directed to your offense against sins because your sins have offended God. And the only help comes from our Savior. We read that passage in Matthew chapter 6, verses 25 through 34. Because our Savior mentions anxiety six times. Of those six mentions in that section, uh, three of them are commands. Verse 25, do not be anxious about your life of Matthew 6. Verse 31 of Matthew 6, do not be anxious about your life. Verse 34, do not be anxious about the future. I would say to a great extent, there's a lot of anxiety in our world today. But then how does Christ identify the personal impact anxiety which worry has on the mind, which is just extreme ungodly worry? Well, first it is self-absorption. You're really not worried about other people, you're worried about yourself. Secondly, it is self-absorption about everything in the here and now. With little to no outlook on the future kingdom and its goals. So you're no longer kingdom-minded. You, you are focused on this world which is coming to an end. Instead of thinking about the kingdom that will never end that you are now a part of. Thirdly, our Savior says that there's a lack of trust. That sinful worry, anxiety, when you care about yourself, you're absorbed about yourself, your future, and not concerned about the things of God, it reveals a lack of trust in God. So ultimately, it's an issue of faith. It's not an issue of saving faith for the Christian. It's an issue of their confidence and faith in God, that even now he's still in control, that even now he's still at work, even now he still cares for you. I have to use this because it's in our time, so maybe this was you too. Also, you, you thought you had something because you didn't put your mask on. You started worrying because you forgot the mask that's going to save your soul and bring you into glory. Oh, that's not you. That's a form of, that's a form of anxiety that you're worried about something that you cannot control. Now, if there's a responsibility in wearing the mask, you put the mask on, but if you forgot the mask, you can't control what happens that doesn't happen to you. What did you instead? You worry. And don't trust God. That COVID or no COVID, Christ still rules. That he's still king. He will always be king. Now our confidence is in him. Whenever we worry, it's a display of a lack of trust and faith. And so our Savior through the Apostle says in Philippians 4, 6 through 7, something that you may know and be familiar with. 
do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer, supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. Now, as our Savior commanded in Matthew, the command is given here, too. It's, it's, this is not optional. You, you cannot be anxious and pray confidently. So take this anxiety to God. That's what uh, the Apostle Peter says. In 1 Peter chapter 5, 6 through 7, humble yourselves therefore under the mighty hand of God so that at the proper time he may exalt you, casting not some, not the ones you don't care for, but all your anxieties on him because he cares for you. Now listen, my dear saints, to believe that God cares for you is to be able to cast your cares and your anxieties to him, rolling them to him. Not rolling them uphill so it can roll downhill back to you. Casting it completely on him. You know what happens? That care is no longer your own. It all belongs to God. And your confidence is no longer in that, that object of fear and anxiety, but the object of your confidence is God. Under every circumstance. I mean, your fear may be, your anxiety may be an economic anxiety. That should be cast on the Lord. It all belongs to Him. Jesus said, if the lilies of the field are so clothed, well, what about you? You're precious in His sight. But then He says, the issue is that sin is your faith, O ye, O you of little faith. Is it not true, my dear saints, that in these moments that God wants our confidence to be in Him? Not in ourselves, not in the economy, not in the government. Oh, my dear saints, I beg of you, please, not in the election. Please, I implore you, by the mercy of God, not in the election. Oh, may your faith not rest in a dot you put in a bubble. Please, let it rest in Christ. Are you worried about the left wing getting in and the right wing getting kicked out on election day? Oh, you have little faith. You believe one man can undo God's plan? No. Oh, we're not fretting like the world frets. Oh, if this person is in the we're going to lose all of our freedoms. My dear saints, you've been set free in Christ. You will lose nothing he secured for you. Should there be some thought about these things? Absolutely. But anxiety over anything is a lack of faith in God. Let that not be the way you approach anything in life. I can't list them all. We'll be here all day and it might rain again. But you know what causes you anxiety and worry. You know what it is. Because it consumes you more than Christ. Our Savior is so tender, so merciful. He says, cast it on me. I care for you. But I won't care for you in the way that you think. I care for you in a way that is best for you so that you may be conformed into my image. As you think about welcoming dear, my dear brothers and sisters in Christ, other saints who may be struggling, and if these are your struggles, just know that the Savior waits to aid, to help, to strengthen you, to forgive you, to kindly lead you out of this trash heap that you're in. Let us not get caught up to this world's thinking of looking for a twinkie in a trash bin. 
when our treasures are in heaven. Let's lay our treasures in heaven. Be a welcoming, loving, caring, praying, pursuing saint. If you know a brother, sister in Christ who's dealing with any of these issues, please be compassionate toward them. Be merciful, pray for them, encourage them, build them up. For the glory of God. Let us pray. To my most gracious Father, I pray that we as your people will not grow weary in doing well. For knowing that in due season we will reap if we do not lose heart or give up. The endurance and the encouragement to go forward comes from our Savior. Forgive us, O oh God. May we confess our sins of not loving each other with a sense of relentless pursuing love as you've shown us. May we not just think on the sermon today and the text of Scripture and Scriptures given to us. May we act on them with joy, with passion, and with a zeal that comes from your Holy Spirit. In the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, I pray. Amen.